Okay. Well, I'm so glad you were able to do that because I didn't see the button, but now we're recording. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Terry. How's it going? Hi, I'm well. How are you, David? Good. It's good to see you. Likewise. It's been a couple of years. So David was a yeah. student of mine. When was that? Two or three years ago? Uh, I think it was, uh, hmm, might have been hot, three now. It was a hot minute ago. That's what. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we got to visit Brian's farm and he'll be talking tomorrow. So that's cool. I feel like a lot of things are coming together at this convergence of people and connections. So it's like a convergence. It's, uh, it really is to the truest sense. So we're excited to hear about uh, what you've been doing the last little bit and all the cool projects you've been involved with. So I'll let you take it Thanks. away. So I'm hoping that I can share my screen. Oh, it looks like I can. Good. Um, because I'm going to share some slides with folks. Now I have to do the fancy like resizing thing. Um, but I'm so glad to be here. And what I'm hoping that we can talk about are some definitions and understandings of what food justice is, what we mean when we're talking about all these terms, um, and how some case studies from around the country of folks who are approaching food justice and food insecurity, and then kind of what we're doing um, on a, a local basis. So without further ado, I'll just jump in. Um, my name is Terry Kempton. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, I'm the Outback Farm Manager, and I'm an instructor at Huxley and Fairhaven at Western Washington University. Um, my background is really coming from a place of passion about food, agriculture, community building, that's just the thread that's run through my life. I started farming in 1996, and I first worked with permaculture starting in 2000 in Central America as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I worked at the research and development department of a seed company, so seeds play a big role in what I do and teach. Um, and I've done a lot of ecosystem restoration work. You know, all of it kind of comes together, as we know, in permaculture. Um, I have to shine a little spotlight on my daughter because she's adorable and she's a handful, but she's my little farmer girl. Um, so when I'm not working on farm stuff, I'm usually with her. Uh, Western Washington University is a school of about 16,000 people. We're in beautiful Bellingham, Washington. It's north of Seattle by about an hour and a half. Up. I think we just lost audio. I haven't changed anything, so I'm concerned. Oops. Maybe it was just me. Is, can everyone hear just fine? You can give a little thumbs up if you can. There was well, a glitch. There was a glitch. Okay. There was a glitch. It sounds great. We can hear you now, but there was a Okay, glitch. great. Definitely um, just you know, interrupt me if you can't hear me because I'm not touching the mute or anything. So if my internet gets weird, just sure. let me know. Well, it's um, going great now. Great. So here on the coast, we are in the cold hardiness zone 8B. We get about 30, 35 inches annually of rainfall, um, which is a lot. It's not as much actually as I thought it was going to be. So it means we get lots of water. Water management is one of our issues, but also water conservation uh, is one of our strengths, I think, up here when we do it right. Um, at Western, I teach food and farming classes. Some of them include experiential learning in the outback. That's our hands-on in the farm, getting training with how to um, do all of the nitty gritty details of farming, agroecology and permaculture planning, and eco-gastronomy. So students often in my permaculture planning class, they actually have to go through the kind of talking parts of a PDC and they have to find a piece of property and actually create a whole permaculture plan for it. And they spend all quarter working on that, which is great. I accompany that with a lot of field trips to local farms so they can see both conventional farms, organic farms, and we usually visit Brian at Inspiration Farm to see what more of a permaculture structure and setup looks like. One of the colleges in which I teach is Fairhaven College. That's the entity that actually owns or is in charge of managing the campus farm. Um, it's a, an interesting school. Um, David, did you go through Fairhaven or were you a Huxley student? I went through Fairhaven. Okay, yeah, so David can tell you more about it too. But it's an alternative model of education. There are no grades. It's all by self-reflection and self-narrative evaluations. Um, 
everyone designs their own concentration that they're focusing on. And we get a lot of students who are interested in sustainable food systems because that's a place where they can come to study it. You know, it's not a really common degree yet. Um, and so we have a lot of really enthusiastic students. Um, the Outback Farm is right on campus. It's between two dorm communities. And the whole reason that we're not uh, a dorm five times over is because there's a wetland that runs through the middle. And because that's delineated, it means that we're protected from development, which is great. Um, it's about five acres and it started about 48 years ago. And it was really with students who decided like, hey, it's 1972 we live here now. Uh, they moved into a couple of historic cabins that were there. Over the years, there have been cows, pigs, a dairy, there have been goats, a spinning and a weaving studio, a woodworking shop. Um, it's kind of gone through a lot of different iterations. And at this point, we, our only animals are bees and chickens. Uh, and we focus on permaculture style food forest agriculture, and then on a kind of more traditional market side of organic annuals. Uh, we also have an herb garden and work with plant medicine. We have everything from culinary herbs that are really familiar to more traditional medicinal plants like Angelica, Agrimony, um, Ella Campaign. We've got a really nice selection. Um, we have some permanent structures. So our outdoor classroom is about 800 square feet. Ask me why I know. It's because the only classes that are allowed to meet in person this year are meeting outside in our outdoor classroom. We also have a tool shed, a storage shelter. We've got a submerged hot house. That's the image on the right hand side here. It's lovely in the winter time. Um, and we have a greenhouse that we use both for starts and then for also production. A big feature of the farm are community gardens. David, we now have 62 beds in the community gardens and they are all full with a wait list. It's a big part of what we do is encourage people to experiment uh, and give them the support and the tools they need to get started. And that's open for students, student groups, faculty, staff, and then we have a few community members from Greater Bellingham also. Uh, and I mentioned that we have chickens. We raised chicks last spring. We did not win the uh, gamble too much, so we ended up with a lot of roos that had to be rehomed. Um, but that's a, a really wonderful, we have so many students who are really enthusiastic to learn about chickens and chicken management. And of course the eggs are a hot commodity also. So that's a, a cherished part of the farm. Uh, but the permaculture aspect is, is something that really makes us unique in that we talk about zones, we talk about levels of permanence, we um, talk about stacking functions, we're building demo beds for um, showcasing guilds, guild plantings, and talking about what that's like. Uh, and just the concept that a regenerative form of agriculture really lies within perennial structures. And so we have um, about two acres in a food forest. And it's, um, and David probably was kind of like this when you were there too. It's a mix of fruit and nut trees, a lot of berry shrubs and um, some smaller plants. And then we still are fighting weeds quite a bit because we don't have enough intentional plants in there. So that's one of our goals for this coming year. Uh, but to me, the most important thing that we do is that we get students involved in their own food production. So a lot of students, when they come, they're curious, but they've never touched a seed. They've never put a plant in the ground. They've never weeded or tended. They haven't harvested. Um, yesterday, I taught 15 freshmen how to use a pickaxe. You know, I mean, there was one person who had used it on summer trail work. There are other people who did not know what it was called and had never seen one in person before. Uh, there's just no substitute for that. Uh, opportunity to really just get your hands dirty and get in the ground. I think we can all agree upon that. And there are a lot of classes on campus that use the farm as a primary classroom. This is a list of classes that are using it just this quarter. It's pretty extensive. So um, we're the only classes pretty much on campus that are allowed to meet in person because we have this experiential nature. And there's a lot of different applications for the farm as you can imagine and it's wonderful to see everyone taking advantage of that space. Uh, to lead us more to the topic today as a little introduction, I've noticed that college farms and gardens, we're a little unique because we're on usually state property, but we want to be teaching about agriculture. It's, you know, usually you weren't farming within a state bureaucratic process. So it's um, a, a negotiable, it's a lot of negotiation kind of figuring out how that works. Um, and campus farms and gardens tend to go in one of two directions. They either tend to be a market garden to instruct students like here's how you can be a farmer and make a living and this is great. 
Evergreen State College has an amazing five acre farm, but it's a market farm. So everything gets sold and that money is what sustains the farm. Very realistic, students come out of that training, like they're good to go, they're ready to like start their business. Um, ours is in a different direction and we're really aimed towards food justice. If you're a market farm and you have to make sure you're making enough money, you can't give stuff away. We'd rather give stuff away. Uh, and we do that through a lot of different avenues. One is that our staff is welcome to take home food as they need. Volunteers, we have work parties, people come, they work, they can take home some of the harvest. We contribute to the food pantries, which I'll get into in a moment. But then we also have signs that we put up in season that show people what's ready to be picked and how to pick it. So like last year we had eight rows of our field that were all for harvesting um, salad. It was just different kinds of salad greens and students were invited to come out and just literally pick themselves a salad bowl and then go and eat it. Um, having that kind of free for all or harvest yourself is just, it's attractive to students, it engages them in a new way, it empowers them in a unique way, but it does mean that we're not like measuring and selling everything. Um, so we really are oriented towards that justice piece. And of course, I brought my passion for seed and seed saving. Uh, the farm I don't think had ever really gotten into that before. And so we, our goal is to grow enough for seed and save enough for seed that we can then contribute. Like we have a local seed swap in the spring. Ooh, I hope we figured that out during COVID too, because I really want it. Um, but that we're able to give back to the community that's given us so much. Uh, in addition, then we also teach about the, I think it's, first of all, empowering to be able to follow a plant for its entire life cycle and understand where it comes from and, and how to care for it throughout. But then I also like teaching about everything from GMOs um, and to the politics of seed and intellectual property and free trade agreements, kind of the whole um, spectrum of seeds is just um, devastating and fascinating, both. So to turn our attention towards food justice, um, food justice is communities exercising their right to grow, sell, and eat healthy food. At the bottom of it, it really is quite straightforward. But we can't talk about justice in terms of eaters until we really grapple with the issues in food production. And I'll just kind of go through this quickly, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't stop and acknowledge that when we talk about people care in permaculture ethics, that we need to be talking about just labor practices too. Are the people who are growing our food working in safe environments? Are they making an okay living? Can they support themselves? All of that's really important. Let's take a look at the world. So around the world, people spend a different amount of their income on food. So like here in Nigeria, they're spending more than 50% of their disposable income on food, just on basic food. On the flip side, we pay the least amount based on percentage of income the least amount on food compared to the rest of the world. We are very, very accustomed to cheap food. Um, and by some measures, it's cheaper than it's ever been. So we spend less than 10% on disposable income on food. And when researchers first began tracking the figure about 90 years ago, it was closer to 25%. So it really has dropped. Um, and you know, there are pros and cons of the system. So the pros are that is more accessible. That means more food is going to more people. But of course, the con is that the inexpensive uh, supermarket fare that consumers now expect, it comes with a, a huge hidden human cost and environmental cost. I'm gonna set the environmental cost aside because that's kind of a different content and lecture. Um, but I do wanna note that since I'm gonna be talking about um, migrant farm labor, that if anyone is a part of that community and feels sensitive to it, please take care of yourself. Don't hesitate to step away. Agriculture has long been the US industry's most profitable sector. Our society as a whole, we kind of tend to look down on jobs that get people dirty. Uh, so like picking vegetables always used to be called stoop labor. And a majority of the people who do this work still are undocumented migrant farm workers. Their annual wages usually amount to about $13,000 a year. That's a figure from the United Farm Workers. Just to compare that, uh, minimum wage in Washington is $22,880. So of course it is hard to survive on that dollar figure. Most farm work in America is performed by immigrants, most of whom are undocumented and therefore exploitable. Big agribusinesses that hire these immigrants will tell you that they need an unfettered supply of cheap labor because they cannot find Americans willing to do those jobs. 
Um, when you consider what those jobs entail, right? It's backbreaking work, terrible, often dangerous conditions, subsistence wages with little or no time off. And of course, none of the protections or perks that a lot of us enjoy, like paid sick days at your job. It's hard to see why anyone with other options would subject themselves to a life that is barely a step above slavery. Um, and of course, the struggle isn't new. The slave trade has been tied to agriculture starting from uh, the sugar trade. The agribusiness sector has really gotten away with a lot of this exploitive and sometimes illegal practices. Um, and they, they usually have some threats that they tend to go to. Um, oh, okay, I'm just noticing a comment I used to read a lot, but now I'm trying to learn about crypto and what I've been managing, contemplating what to do next. Okay, I'm not sure, Marcy, how to interpret your question, but maybe as I go forward. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, you know, a lot of agribusinesses, they kind of have threats that are their go-to comments where they say like, well, you know, if it's not, if I can't get cheap enough labor here, then we're just gonna outsource our food production to China. Um, it's kind of a backwards thing of like, yeah, but if you have to pay workers higher wages, somehow then you'd have fewer people wanting to do them. I don't know, we already are off shoring a lot of our food production. For anyone who doesn't know about chicken production, a lot of uh, you know eggs are shipped to China to hatch and then they raise the chickens and then they ship the meat back to the United States. Um, we do have a lot of weird things that we do um, internationally. Uh, the other threat is that, you know, if they increase their spending on labor, then those costs are going to be passed on to the consumer. So that's the one that we, that is the most common of like, ooh, you know, if we have to pay people a living wage, no one will be able to afford food anymore. Several studies have been conducted, however, and I've got some links for people if they are interested. They kind of expose these as hollow threats. So during the, the recent years, the agricultural industry has actually had huge profits and growth in profits. Um, there's been an 80% annual increase. That's more than all major industries uh, other than that. And so, you know, no, no doubt these record profits have something to do with the fact that real wages for farm workers have remained stagnant throughout that same period of the past few years. But here's the really great take home from that. Okay, so a report by the Economic Policy Institute in 2011, so it's a little dated, but they found that an increase in farm workers' wages, I get this, 40%, so almost half of their wages increase, uh, or increased by almost half, would result in an annual household spending $16 a year. So that's kind of sobering for, you know, kind of on the nicer side of getting a lunch out or something that that would pay for farm workers to have a 40% wage increase. Pretty incredible. Um, going back to the 1980s, Ronald Reagan signed a bill into law which introduced some protections for migrant workers. It's come to be known as the guest worker program. These protections include a minimum wage guarantee and the housing that they have uh, has to meet certain acceptable standards. And there has to be a guarantee that the worker will be paid three quarters of their full pay should a season end early. And all that sounds, you know, not too bad, right? And um, the modern version of this is called the H-2A Visa Worker Program. The H-2A um, program establishes a means for people, for uh, agricultural employers who anticipate a shortage of local workers to bring folks to the U.S. to perform seasonal agricultural work. Um, and that, you know, when there's, a, when there's a shortage of labor, labor. So that's one of the big questions is like, well, how can there be a shortage of labor when one out of every 11 people in the country are unemployed? Like, why isn't everyone um, pitching in? And I always ask my students, and David, I don't know if you remember if I asked your class of like, well, then why isn't everybody farming? And um, hopefully folks who are here who do farm, you know, kind of recognize the like, because it's hard. It's really, it's really hard. It's kind of literal backbreaking labor. And, um, you know, it hasn't worked out to find a lot of local domestic employees who are willing to do this kind of work. So here's a story of a, a Colorado onion farmer. He brought in only two thirds of his usual H-2A contingent because he wanted to hire locally. He figured that there are people in his community who are unemployed and they would snap up that opportunity to make some extra summer cash. And his quote is, it didn't take me six hours to realize that I'd made a hell of a mistake. Uh, and yeah, between 6 a.m. and the lunch break, then all of the local people had quit and some just walked off and never gave a reason. Um, 25 individuals said specifically that their work was too hard and they wouldn't stay with it. Um, here is a case in point. This is one of the few remaining photographs of something called the A-Team in 1965. Is this familiar to anyone? 
Have you heard of the A team from back in the day? I'd be totally curious. You can put it in the comments because I can see those really easily. So um, in 1965, the Secretary of Labor, Willard Wirtz, he wanted to recruit 20,000 high schools, uh, high school boys to replace the hundreds of thousands of Mexican agricultural workers who had been laboring in the U.S. under the, the guest workers program at that time. Uh, and so this program, um, let's see, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. Only. I'm just kind of skipping forward because I want to be aware of time. Uh, okay, so it, this was called um, the A team that stands for Athletes in Temporary Employment as Agricultural Manpower strapping young boys uh, to keep the agricultural production underway while uh, civil rights work was going on amongst the migrant labor community with activists like Cesar Chavez. Um, most students quit in a number of weeks. Others staged big strikes. At the end, it, the program collapsed early. It was considered a giant failure. It was tried, it was buried, that was the attempt, and it was never tried again. Um, there's a great analysis from Lori Flores at Stony Brook University who says these high school students had the words and the whiteness to say what they were feeling and they could act out in a way that Mexican Americans who had been living this way for decades simply didn't have the power or space for the American public to listen to them. The students dropped out because the conditions were atrocious and the growers weren't able to mask that up like they usually do. And I've got an, a link to an NPR article about the A-Team, which is fascinating if anyone would like that. So the H-2A program, it's temporary. There's no path to a green card or citizenship. There's no access to services, which is, you know, people may shrug off, but that means healthcare pretty much. And that's a, a really awful thing. Um, it, they're totally at the mercy of company regarding hours. So they may have too many hours. They may not have enough hours. Uh, the employers, they can terminate the job at any time. There's no job security. It's terribly hard work. There's, in general, no union or bargaining or negotiation power. Um, and of course, there's no individual power. Like, there's the, if you complain, you get fired. And so it really is a, a system of oppression. And often that, you know, you have to provide adequate living conditions. I want to look at that. So of the provided living conditions, it's, um, it's, it's pretty horrifying. Housing has to be provided or rentals have to be available uh, that meet minimum health and safety standards. So let's look at these minimum health and safety standards. This is a, a, an example from North Carolina. There's no requirement for windows. Who needs windows in a house? Um, you have to have eight feet by eight feet per person. So pretty much if you extend your arms out and you figure you've got you know, a foot on either side, uh, that's the space that's required for you. And of course, everything is shared. There is no privacy. So I love to tell my students, I'm like, hey, how many people are sharing houses? How many people like have to fight with their housemates about who puts what in the fridge, right? And that's usually with two to four people. Um, but you know, folks, they have to have one fridge per thirty per twenty seven people. Excuse me. Um, they only have to have one toilet per fifteen people. Um, if it's a urinal, they only have to have one urinal for twenty five men. Um, it's, you know, really kind of remarkable what our country has decided is okay for farm laborers. And we really are talking about Mexico predominantly. Uh, in 2014, for example, there were almost 90,000 H-2A visas and like 84 of those 90,000 were from Mexico. So we're really kind of talking about that. Um, and I, I can also share, I see that someone asked for links. It's great. I'll share them at the end where I can kind of copy and paste. Um, but it, here we get into things about NAFTA and the free trade agreement and how that has um, kind of devastated agriculture in Mexico. I'm still just keeping an eye on the time and I'm gonna keep moving, but that's a, a really lucrative area of research. Further complicating matters, of course, is our current US political environment. So we have a lot of, uh, I'm trying to think of a really nice way of saying this. We have policy questions about immigration and border enforcement. Um, and of course, that is designed to be a huge discouragement, either by logistics or by fear, um, which will affect the labor pool for sure. Um, so, you know, there are lots of people in the field who are working on, on this issue of migrant labor and kind of saying, like, we may be in, like, primed for a really huge shift when this plentiful supply of cheap labor for our fields, you know, that's been kind of a hallmark of U.S. farming disappears. Um, I would argue that maybe that's overdue. 
<laughs> so I always like to look at some positive solutions. So I'm going to share one that's local and absolutely wonderful. So this is a story of what our family calls justice berries. Um, they're agricultural workers who ask themselves like, okay, wait a minute, what if we um, actually owned the land and we were able to make decisions for our own working conditions, our own hours, our own healthcare, our own safety, our families, all of that. And so they formed a cooperative, Cooperativa Tierra y Libertad, the Cooperative of Land and Liberty. Um, they own farms and berry fields in the rural towns of Cedra Woolley and Linden. And I heard they also just got some property by Everson. Um, they added 65 acres recently, so they're doing really well. And they started very small. They produced like 150 to 200 boxes a week to sell just in a, a handful of markets throughout the region. But they have just continued to grow and expand that both in the market and then they're moving into the CSA space also. Uh, and one of their statements is, you know, we're doing this for the families so that they can eat the fruits of their labor while also having opportunity, education, and the chance to become professionals if they want. Um, and again, I've got a really nice article about that, but it's super great. Another um, reason for hope here is that the Agricultural Justice Project is working hard behind the scenes to try to transform the existing agricultural system. Um, they say, we seek empowerment, justice, and fairness for all who labor from farm to retail. Central to our mission are the principles that all humans deserve respect, the freedom to live with dignity and nurture community, and share responsibility for preserving the Earth's resources for future generations. And so the, they've created a label, here it is, the Food Justice Certified Label. And so um, if you see something with this label, you'll know that farmers receive a fair percentage of the quote unquote food dollar, allowing for a stable and dignified life for their families. And this brings us to another really important term, which is food sovereignty. And I just went ahead and put a definition that I love right there on the screen. Um, great, take a screen cap, I can also copy and paste that. But it's the, the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. Um, yeah, and this, it strikes me that like there's so many overlaps with permaculture ethics, principles and practice, all of that. One is that it focuses on food for people. So it's insisting that food is not just a commodity. It's not just endless silos of grain that go mostly to feeding animals. Like this is, we need to grow food for people. And we recognize that it's at the center of our policies and decisions. The second is traditional knowledge and really building on those knowledge and skills and using research to support and pass on this information to future generations. Uh, the third one is working with nature. It sounds familiar, right? Uh, optimizing the contributions of ecosystems and improving resilience. The next is that it values food providers. So supporting sustainable livelihoods, that's what we've been talking about, and just overall respecting workers, understanding that they are valued and making sure that they are compensated. The fifth is localizing food systems. So reducing the distance between food and the people that consume it. Uh, reject dumping and inappropriate food aid. So, you know, hey, you have a surplus, but let's not just like drop that on an unsuspecting community that may or may not be appropriate to use it. Um, and resist dependency on remote and unaccountable corporations. So really kind of putting a face on the business. And that leads to the next one, which is connection. So, you know, you've kind of got the connection, you're putting the control locally, you know your farmer, you know your butcher, um, you know your consumers, which is great. And it's all kind of based on an understanding that food is sacred. It's a gift. It's a gift of life. It shouldn't be squandered. And, you know, once again, that food is not a commodity just to be stored and traded on the stock market. This is life and livelihood and how we share it. Does anyone have any questions about the, like, the production side before I move on to a slightly different topic? What is the name of the cooperative again? I will put it here. It's the Cooperative of Land and Liberty. And also, um, Familius, I'm going to put down our local Apparently I can't type in, remember I have a toddler? Okay, so um, I can't type and talk at the same time, but the Familia Unidas por la Justicia is the local farm worker union. And that's a really um, fascinating and hope inspiring uh, wave that's happening around is that the farm workers are starting to unionize and really make progress, which is wonderful. 
So now I want to talk about food justice from an eater perspective. So again, food justice, communities exercising their right to grow, sell, and eat healthy food. Let's talk about that. Uh, and I, this is a lot of words. I know it's a lot of words. You don't have to read it all right now. If you're interested, you can take a screen cap or I can copy and paste it. But I'm taking the lead here from the Black Food Sovereignty Council and Coalition. Um, you, again, you'll see that there's a huge overlap with what we're seeing from the food, uh, the migrant labor justice movement and with permaculture. Um, every, everyone is kind of coming together. I love that we're talking about this at a convergence because this is a convergence in and of itself. But it's in taking the environment into account. It's creating community. It's making sure that workers are taken care of. It's making sure that marginalized communities are getting what they need. And so from a permaculture perspective, I think this is really central to our work for a couple of reasons. It's of course people care just as the food justice from a production side is people care. But we really are talking about fair share here. And I know there's a lot of ways to interpret fair share. Is it taking care of future generations? Absolutely. Um, but I also think that fair share is like, lit like literally, who's getting the pie? Who's getting a slice of pie? How can we be active and intentional about distributing our abundance and sharing that? To me, it helps to kind of back up and understand what the problem is. And I think that there's a lot of terms that are passed around that we may all kind of use casually and not have a real deep understanding. I'm hoping that we can kind of investigate and maybe help people feel more empowered to have that discussion. Uh, so we can't have justice when people have widely different experiences getting the quality food they need, especially when that's a factor of things like race, identity, and income. So let's define food insecurity. At the heart of it, food insecurity is not getting enough good food that's culturally appropriate, close, and affordable. So in other words, it's when someone has to worry frequently about how to feed themselves or their family. And there really are three big pieces in it for me. Uh, it means at least these areas of challenge. The first one is access. Where can you get food? The second is quality. What kind of food can you access? And the third is quantity. So like how much food? The first one, that food access, let's really hone in on that for a second. So how far away is your food source and how can you get there? Who's heard of a food desert? Probably you can give you a thumbs up or you can like wave to me, right? Food desert, well, what is a food desert? My own husband asked me this last night and I thought, oh goodness, I've been remiss. So a food desert is anyone who lives in an area where they do not have really easy access to especially perishables. That's kind of the measuring. Like, you know, you could probably find a bag of chips at any grocery store or bodega or what have you, but are you able to get things like meat or eggs or dairy or vegetables or fruit? Those are kind of the big perishable questions. Um, and so according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, food deserts are areas that lack access to affordable fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low fat milk, and other foods that make up the full range of a healthy diet. Just the kind of general guideline, if you're more than a mile away from a, a decent grocery store with no car, that means you're in a food desert. In some places, this is super, super common. One out of four Baltimore residents, for example, live in a neighborhood without a grocery store. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in any of these like articles, do put it in the chat and I'll make sure that I copy and paste those. Um, so, you know, food deserts are, as you can imagine, demographically unequal. So food insecurity doesn't affect everyone equally. It is really a factor of race and class in very many ways. Um, it's both very cool to me and very embarrassing that we can map, you can Google almost any city and it, you can look at the map of where the food deserts are. So it's very cool, we have all this data. It's also really embarrassing because we know what the problems are and yet there they are. Um, and so my question to you is this, like, okay, well then we just add grocery stores, right? So like if you put a Whole Foods in the middle of Baltimore, problem's done, right? What do you think? I don't think so. We're all good, yeah, and why not? Any thoughts on why not? Oh, it's such a quiet group. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, That's that one. nice grocery store that they just put in, uh, can you afford to buy the food that's there? <laughs> yes, so um, there are lots of other factors, like can, can you afford it? Do you have the equipment to cook that kind of food? Do you have the knowledge and the time to prepare that kind of food? Is it culturally appropriate? All of those things. And so I wanna introduce an alternate term that is starting to be used more and more. Um, and 
and it's based on this, the sustainable food movement, in many ways, at least the people who are getting the attention up until now, um, it's been pretty white. It's been white led. And I'm so glad that this is starting to shift, but it often neglects the needs and the root problems of diverse communities. Um, and so the alternate term that I ask us to consider is food apartheid. Um, because it takes everything into account. You know, it brings us to kind of the more important question of like, what are the social inequities that we see? What are we doing to erase that injustice? So it looks at the whole system. It's not just, is there a grocery store, but, and is it affordable, but also like, what are the factors of racism here or geography or faith or economics and class? Uh, it takes all of that into account. And because this is such a dynamite article, I don't think I can resist just cutting and pasting it right here. It's from The Guardian. And that's a real pretty link, I apologize for that, but it's a great article. Um, and this is the, uh, Carrie Washington, who co-founded Black Urban Growers, and she's the one who uh, came up with the term of food apartheid that's so useful. And she said this, and I think it's really great. I eventually realized that I couldn't concentrate on food alone because there were so many things that were intersecting. I saw that people who were in the first community garden I grew were mostly low income and had no health insurance. So the garden wasn't just being used for food, but also for well-being being and for medicine. The healthcare industry is part of this conversation. As a physical therapist, I used to see billions more spent on treatment than prevention. Look at the pharmaceutical companies. In my neighborhood, there's a fast food restaurant on every block. Wendy's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Popeye's, Little Caesars Pizza. Now drug stores are popping up on every corner too. So you have the fast food restaurants that of course cause diet related diseases and then you have the pharmaceutical companies there to fix it. They go hand in hand. The fact is if you do prevention, someone is going to lose money. If you give people access to really good food and a living wage job, someone's going to lose money. As long as people are poor and as long as people are sick, there are jobs to be made. Just follow the money. Um, so when we start to look at solutions and kind of what do we do with these challenges and these problems to enact real change, then we have to focus on food production, of course, and supermarket locations and systemic racism and economics and healthcare, right? We're seeing that like everything is connected. Uh, and so we have to be really creative. I think that we're going to be changing our understanding of who a farmer is and what a farmer looks like. Let's look at some solutions. This is one example. This is the People's Grocery in West Oakland, California. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Bay Area, but West Oakland has been a very challenged area. Um, it traditionally has been kind of low income, and it took about a decade for this grocery store to jump through all of the bureaucratic hoops to be able to open. And as you can see, this is Brahma Mahdi, the founder, and you can see here that they have a garden space in the back where they grow, harvest, and then sell directly. And um, because it is a co-op style, then it's more affordably priced for local people too. Uh, there also are a lot of urban farming programs. So if you're from Seattle and the Pea Patch program, you know, we see a lot of that. Uh, this is a photo from the DC Urban Greens program. And their goal is to provide fresh, free food to stressed neighbors, along with a relaxed feeling of no fences and we touch the hearts of people is what they say. Um, here's a project of hope and progress. There are so many everywhere that just kind of pop up. Uh, this is a group called Gangsters to Growers. They pay their farmers $15 an hour, and that includes their training process. One of the participants named Trent said, I was so used to seeing death that I didn't know how it would feel to see something grow. To see plants grow full of life from something I control is probably the best feeling in the world. Um, and there's a really nice article I can help you find about that. I think it's interesting that communities of faith are getting involved in food. Uh, the, I wanted to do more for people than just pray, said this pastor. His name is Heber Brown, and he blends his faith and farming to end food security in local black churches. Here's another community of faith. This is in Denver, Colorado. It's part of Hope Methodist Church, and this plot of land is called The Land. I know, not the most creative name, um, but their mission is to integrate agricultural practices and spiritual disciplines. The land invites people to experience discipleship as they care for the earth, harvest God's gifts, and fill the souls and stomachs of their neighbors. This is a local example from our town. Bellingham is not that huge. We have about 120,000 people, but we have a substantial food desert. There was an Albertsons that went out of business. Their non-competition clause, or whatever the official name of it, prevents any other grocery store from moving in for 10 years. And so there it sits, an empty structure with no other grocery going in. And the community response um, has been unbelievable. And there now are 18 
food pantries and they're regularly stocked with produce grown in community gardens and individual gardens as well to provide food for that community. Um, this is a story from New Mexico. This is Elga Garza. She um, convinced Dollar General, which if you've been through the Southwest, it, they're just everywhere. That's often the only option for buying food. It's mostly processed and packaged food. Uh, she convinced Dollar General to sell local produce from local small scale farms. Um, she said, this is a way to show other corporations how they can invest in communities and be good neighbors to us. But of course, her driving interest was in providing healthier food for her community. Any questions about kind of food access, food deserts, food apartheid before I move on to our case study? Is everybody doing okay? It's a lot yeah. of talking. It's a great well, presentation. Okay, so cool. So far, we're really enjoying it. Thank you. So I want to talk about food, student food insecurity because it's a, I think it's a bigger issue than people realize. And of course, if we use that to extrapolate out to society at large, then, um, you know, we can all relate to it. Okay, so I know it's, this is one of those studies where you're like, mm, you had to study this to understand it, but shockingly, students are less likely to go to class if they don't have access to food. And they actually found that students are 52% less likely to go to class if they don't have access to food that morning. Nationwide, the federal government, the GAO, they did a study on hunger in college students. They found that over a third of college students don't always have enough to eat was how they qualified it. And so they're just over a third. Well, we also uh, did a study. It was wonderful. It was several years ago. David, you might have been there when this was going on. Um, but there was a peer-to-peer -peer study um, of food insecurity that went into great detail. 68% of our students said that they had skimped or skipped a meal due to finances. So this is way wow. above national average. Yeah, right? So it's hard to teach when you know that two thirds of your class are sitting there with their stomachs growling. Um, I, I'm assuming that the number is higher than the national average for two reasons. One is that if you're peer to peer, you're gonna be way more revealing about the truth of your circumstances than if a government agent comes with a survey and people don't feel like doing it or like being fully honest. We also live in a place that uh, the housing market has skyrocketed. You know, the median income is 30,000 a year. The median house price is half a million. So the cost of living has just grown exponentially and it means that students often have to choose between rent and food and they often choose rent. 18% of our students reported going at least an entire day without food due to finances. So, I mean, in a group like us, I don't have my thing up, but just, you know, kind of do the math and figure like one out of every five people. Can you imagine if here in this presentation, two or three of us hadn't eaten for an entire day because we were so broke. So it's a huge, huge problem. And campus took that seriously, which is great. We have currently three programs that address that. One is uh, pantries, and they gave it the acronym WHOLE so that it's, okay, it's like Western hub of living essentials because it's like um, hygiene products and there's a clothes closet and there are things beyond just food. But at the heart of it, it's food pantry. We have three locations for that around campus. There's a swipe out hunger program and that's all through the dining halls. Students who have dining hall meal plans, but they don't, they can donate swipes, they can donate meals, or if they're not using them, then they can give the excess and that's available for students who need um, meals and can't afford the meal plan. And we also, and this has been very handy uh, in our current chapter, is that we have grocery gift cards. If someone's not on campus, that's not a realistic option for them to use the Swipe Out Hunger program or even to access the whole pantries. So um, gift cards to local grocery stores is an option that they can choose. So um, when we started the food pantry program, it really kicked up about three years ago. We joined more than 600 college campuses around the country in having food pantries. Uh, and I go over usually with my students all the locations on campus. So um, mostly it's non-perishable items, but we have arranged for a fridge to hold things like uh, produce from the outback. This is an actual photo of a past year's harvest. Of course, this is part of the big story today is like, so what happens in a pandemic? And I'll give you a hint, it's not good um, because everything shut down. For a hot minute, uh, well, our campus has been locked down mostly since March. And for a hot minute, our local food bank was also shut down. Our food bank serves a fifth of our community. They're used to 18,000 visits a month. 
And so when they shut down to try to figure out like, how can we safely do this? All of a sudden you've got 18,000 people or visit, you know, visits in a month who can no longer do that and access it. And some of those are our students. And you combine that with a locked campus so no one can get into the food pantries. And it's a huge, huge problem. So by the time students are calling me and saying, I'm dumpster diving in a pandemic to try to feed myself, I mean, this is ridiculous. So especially with the food bank closed, obviously there was a lot of grocery surplus and things like that that were um, unclaimed and at play. So we did two uh, gorilla style kind of renegade food pantries. And I mean, it was like, you know, David, this will make you laugh. Jack Herring is like unlocking the building, like we're sneaking in there. Um, and we just picked up huge amounts of surplus from Trader Joe's. They gave us, I don't know, like 300 loaves of bread kind of thing. And we posted on our social media, as you can see, you know, that was our message was like, don't be shy, don't be hungry. Just like, come, this is for you. Um, the two times we did it, we had two to three loads in SUVs. Um, it was gone in four hours. So that was a huge message of like, wow, this is a big problem. It only took two times for campus to circle back with us and be like, you can't do that. You can't just take food that we don't know when it expired. We don't know if it's been properly refrigerated. We, there's a lot of, you know, we have health codes and things like that. We're a state university. And so it took, um, sadly, about two months to figure out a new system, but figure it out we did. This was the first one that we contributed to. So you can see we have a lot of microgreens and things that are there, but we did a walk up, drive up, uh, contactless, um, format of a pop-up food pantry and that has become institutionalized we did it all summer we also have just received funding for fall which is great so we're going to keep that up because our campus is mainly closed so um, there's a big bag that students get of non-perishable food and they can choose from vegan vegetarian gluten-free or omnivore and then we have produce from the farm so that they can get some free nutritious things and we also do work with our local food bank quite a bit um, to you know provide kind of backstop for people who need that. They also are doing a drive up format, which a lot of food banks are right now during the pandemic. But of course, like a big thing that we focus on is empowering students to come grow their own. And so if they're involved in any way or they just come out to the farm and see those like harvest me now signs, they can get food. But in addition, that's why we have those community garden plots. Hey, you can have this spot. It's a raised bed. We'll help give you seeds. We'll help give you tools. We'll make it happen and you can be in charge of, you know, you can decide what to grow and you can harvest it and you can eat that and that's there for you. And so it was, I still look back and think it kind of miraculous that we were immediately deemed essential employees, all of the farm staff. So we were able to keep going and that we were able to come up with safety protocols for our community gardeners so that they could also keep going. Um, and that, you know, is there's a lot of food that's produced there, which is great. Um, sadly, we can't have big open house work parties, um, which is too bad because sometimes we're used to having up to 20 people per work party, but we have received permission just now to have very small groups. It's by reservation only. We can only have five at a time. The good news is we have four a week. So, you know, there's a lot of student interest. There's a lot of student support. When I asked my, I asked my students yesterday, you know, like, what do you hope to learn from this class? So many of them named permaculture. They wanna learn a different way of, of organizing. They wanna learn regenerative agriculture. They wanna survive the apocalypse. Like there's uh, a very kind of frank looking at the food system from this generation and understanding that it's gonna take um, a, a lot of creative vision and work to make it happen. So I would love if anyone wants to follow us on social media, I hope you do. Um, there are 11 beautiful new pages if you want to take a virtual tour of the farm or you want to see some funky historic things. David, you'll want to go, oh my gosh, there's a video from 2001, which in my brain was not that long ago. Trust me, it was that long ago. The video is really dated. It's quite humorous. Um, and there's some historic photos and things there too, but we also highlight student projects and go into great deal about our apiary because um, that's a relatively new thing. So I'll put this up and like if anyone is interested in doing the chip jar, not for me, um, but we are we did do a big fundraiser for our apiary. That's a really great way to, you know, funnel a couple bucks into um, our farm projects. It's um it's tricky to have a very small budget, but a lot of enthusiastic students. So we'd love your help, of course, under no obligation. And I'm hoping now let me stop sharing and we can we can talk about things. 
who has any questions or comments? What struck you? What was confusing or surprising? It's so great to see the progress you've made at the Outback Farm, Terry. It's pretty incredible. So thank you for sharing that, seeing the pictures of harvests and what you've set up for the food insecurity in our area. It's, it's incredible. So I, I hope to visit soon. I hope you do. Yeah, I, I would love to catch up with you. It's been a great thing. And just so everyone, like full disclosure, like David kind of helped cue me in that this job was available. So I super appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Brian, I see you're on here. Hey, yeah, Terry, I got just like the last half of your presentation I was outside, but so awesome, really well put together the presentation and um, I'm really uh, thankful you're there and holding down the fort. We were kind of talking earlier um, when Rain Tree's video played, which you should watch if you haven't seen it already. I haven't seen it yet. My coordinators were so excited about it. Yeah, and anyway, I was sharing some of the history of Outback and my involvement there over the years and how it's really kind of flopped and floundered and sputtered and burped and now it's coming into its own. So <laughs> it's perseverance furthers. Yeah, it's great because, you know, students, their job is to come and go. Like that's, that's what they're supposed to do. And so sometimes you get a wave where people are like really into it and really competent. And then you get some years where like it just doesn't work out. And yeah. even the best intentioned projects, you know, if there's no one there to kind of guide it or to have a, you know, we need to think this through first, then it kind of became a graveyard of good intentions. There were a lot of like, hey, it would be really cool to build this. Oh, never mind, I'm graduating. And then there's <laughs> half a yeah. construction project and all of the materials that are left out and that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, having a cohesive whole and having just someone in the background to kind of have that institutional knowledge, I think has been helpful. Yeah, and I, I have to also say that it's been really wonderful being affiliated with Outback and Huxley and stuff over the years, um, you know, you bringing students out to Inspiration Farm and working with Gigi there, it's really an extension of what happens there. And we have had students that graduate and come here and do a whole season long internship and take it to the next level. So there's yep. that connection between community, greater community, and, and then the, the university community as well. So it, I value that um kind of synergy that happens uh throughout that time and space so do we students are always super inspired and i can't wait to see jericho knock it up with you tomorrow morning with the scything workshop that you're doing because yeah. he's been so passionate about scything and i was like i have an opportunity for you and he was like i'll even get up on a sunday morning it's great. We'll do it. <laughs> well that's what it's gonna take <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, kind of sharing that knowledge and you know, then it's great because then students are understanding that like they kind of become holders of that knowledge. Yes. And part, of, I think David, something that's changed since your tenure probably is that like we have weekly staff meetings and I facilitate them, but we have a staff of eight right now, if you can believe it. So we've got three coordinators and five work study students. And we really, I, we diversify. And so people have their niches and they're kind of holders of that knowledge and then they're responsible for sharing it with people. Um, and that's turned into a really beautiful thing that they don't get a chance to do all that often at that age. Yeah. What are other people thinking? Yeah, we would definitely encourage uh, people to just give feedback or if you have a question or, yeah. Marcy? I do have a question about uh, the backbreaking work that the farm laborers do. Uh, it's like, well, it's backbreaking work. Well, what if it's on a small, like on outback farm, and if that was the average size, you didn't, you had farmers instead of farm laborers or intentional community. Would it still be backbreaking work? Or would it be done in such a way that it wouldn't be backbreaking work, but just good exercise? That's I have my one answer. question. I have, I have one short answer, and then I want to hear what other people's opinions are. Because it definitely, the migrant labor issue is so part and parcel of the industrial food system that I think we can all agree is not going to last. It just can't. It's not a sustainable model. 
It's not a sustainable business model. It's not good for people. It's not good for the environment. And so I think that that's a really different thing to look at than small scale farms that are an alternative. But, you know, some of you are out there doing this every day. What do you think? Is your permaculture style farming brack baking labor or just active out there working on it? Brian, you've got an incredible core because you're scything all the time. He's got the best core. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we will touch on this when I'm talking about appropriate tools and stuff, but really it goes more in, I mean, yes, you can make it backbreaking if you do the same thing all day long. If you're out there picking strawberries in the field for like eight hours, that's backbreaking. If you're doing a little of this, a little of that, you're, you're mixing it up. It's like a, you know, a CrossFit exercise. And it's a lifestyle. It's not, it's, you know, if, if you see the value in the yield that you get out of the end of the day or season or whatever the time period, then it becomes a lifestyle and it becomes something you're invested in. And if you're doing it with other people, it becomes even more joyful and building community and you have long conversations about things totally unrelated to farming. <laughs> um, so there's a lot to unpack there in that, that question. And um, I, I think, I mean, that's what uh, societies that were, lived close to the land did together. And it was not backbreaking, it was, it was joyful and you'd celebrate at the end of the day, so. Has anyone uh, read the book Against the Grain? Hmm. It, I read it and then have always meant to kind of go back to it, but his whole, idea is that we really took a wrong turn when we decided to grow grains then like you know humanity ten thousand years ago like oopsie doodle maybe this wasn't the best idea because with the storage of grains which is why grains became you know so popular you can store it then you end up with surplus if you have surplus <laughs> then you have a power dynamic someone who has more surplus versus someone who doesn't and then it becomes a commodity. And I do think that there's a lot of the problems with commodification of food. Again, because then it's like, well, how do I store it? How do I ship it? How much can I get for it? And it becomes more of an economic, profitable capitalism sort of thing than it does of this is food, who needs it? How can we cook it together? Um, that that really changed. And so, yeah, I think a lot of the kind of backbreaking labor, you know, had to do with like, well, we got to have enough surplus that you do end up just working that wheat every day for, you know, every day. <laughs> I have a quick comment on the backbreakingness. Um, I would say that if we're, if we're hurting ourselves or hurting the nature, then it's not harmonious. I mean, putting the word permaculture even aside. Um, but I also believe the solution is going to come from a societal change and a cultural change. And um, I might be kind of more of an idealistic person, but I have hope and that and humans, and I think humans, when seen and educated, and if we repattern how we're relating as humans, I think it's going to change the way we start or stop buying, and that's going to make a big difference. We've seen this in other small areas, um, but it's so cool to see it start to spread, and I think people, especially as the next generation, are just asking more questions. And so um, one of the things that I realized that we need to do, I went to Washington, and when I was 19 years old and wrote policy for foster care because I was an orphan. And I worked for Senator Hillary Clinton and Mary Landrieu and we, we did, um, I realized a lot of people didn't know the needs. When people were educated about the needs and the hurts, um, there wasn't any argument anymore. And so we just sometimes have to shine light on certain things. I, I'll just give one quick story. Uh, I took my daughter to, I don't know what it was, uh, Earth Skills Gathering or Sustainable Living Conference in Northern Florida. And someone gave her this little button that has Wendy's on it and with the no Wendy's sign. So it's like a don't eat at Wendy's. And it, and it was given to her by someone who told her a story. And that story of the fact that Wendy's is the only fast food chain that refuses to sign a, you know, there's a group of people that talk about farm labor in Northern Florida. They're the, they're one, restaurant that refuses to sign up under this thing. So she goes to school for her first time ever in life with this no windy sign and she's telling the world and it's so neat how many teachers and students reference my daughter as this no windies person. So one person giving one person a button can make a difference and how many people are like, 
uh, yeah, my kid will never go to Wendy's after they talk to your daughter, you know? So that was, I think we can, I believe in people and we can make some amazing changes. This is definitely a generation that is all about that. Um, not hesitant to be thoughtful and critical and definitely asks a lot of questions about sourcing that like I just wouldn't have even known to ask when I was that age. So it's very encouraging. I find this generation very hopeful. With the right uh, news article, we could shut down Wendy's like that, you know, and change things <laughs> around. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about, um, you know, I've been, I'm involved in the, uh, the shellfish aquaculture industry in sort of s Southern Washington and, uh -huh. uh, you know, the harvest, the harvesters are uh, similar dynamic there, you know, a lot of, um, you know, Latin American, you know, uh, illegal immigrant people work in the shellfish industry. And there's also a condition of people that are locals, you know, and uh, there's the, um, the shellfish has the advantage of being able to be profitable on a smaller scale. So there's a bunch of small companies and, um, you know, they can do fine, you know, if the margins are okay, but anything that gets into those margins, it becomes super struggle, you know, and um, it hasn't had the, the issue of like getting, you know, the, the large farm that just dominates the industry, like you would have on, you know, Eastern Washington farms in some level throughout the country. But I just think about those, those, those harvesters and they have a hard time getting recruiting enough people for them, for that, for that job, you know, yeah. good harvesters or clam diggers or, you know, oyster pickers kind of people. Yeah. Similar dynamic though. And sometimes those folks that do make, you know, the lower paid jobs have a lot of drug issues. That's a problem. Um, and, but, you know, whatever could help that, that, you know, those, those companies staff those jobs would be a similar vein of what you're describing there, where you're, you know, on the larger land-based farms. Yeah. And I think it raises a lot of questions and, you know, something that I always stress about permaculture is that it's, it, what makes it unique to me is that it's based on a system of ethics as opposed to a system of profit or a system of regulation or what have you. And that it really asks that question, like if you can't find people to work that job because it is so awful, then what are you growing or producing? And like, how can, you know, if it's that bad, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. Yeah, but it, it's that whole, like I find that there's such beautiful convergence of all of these different schools of thought from different people, but we're all talking about the same thing. It has to be smaller. It has to be more local. It has to be good for everybody, including the environment. It's got to pay more at the end of the day, really, for, for just to attract more people. And that's anytime that we talk about food and pricing, it's, it's such a like double edged sword because we pay less, right? Relatively than the rest of the world for food. We have the cheapest food in the world. And at the same time, if we talk about making food more expensive, then we talk, and then it becomes an access problem because there are people who can't afford it. We have such a, an odd country, right? Oh, right? If you're yeah. if you're paying, uh, you know, a third of your income for health insurance that won't actually help you, right? Then like you don't have uh, money for food, even though we have the cheapest food in the world. It's real. It's so. Also, probably pay more for like you know housing than any country in the world, right? So there's some yeah. kind of relationship between how much we pay for other items. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. So the whole system stacked against like the good healthy food system, like what Terry was saying. It's like, if you're healthy, then the drug companies don't get their money, you know? So conversely, like the big ag, they get all the subsidies and the handouts and the bank loans and all the stuff. And the organic farmers have to pay the fee to get organically certified. And all the small, small farmers don't get any certification. They have to hold bake sales to buy seeds, you know, yep. kind of thing. And so it's totally stacked against healthy food, but we have to be the revolutionaries, the revol foodinaries, you know, and, and I think there's, we may come to a point where the kind of too big to fail um, will fail because yeah. the, the thing about the us scrappy folks who are, you know, doing seed swaps in the basement of a church or whatever, which is what we do every spring, um, you know, but then like what happens if all of a sudden there is a, a massive border change or, you know, if, if there's a huge change in labor or in supply or, you know, that system is so fragile. I like to tell people, we think our democracy is fragile. Wait until I tell you about our food system. Yeah, right? And so. The 
the two <laughs> seed factory warehouses burned down or something like that. And it's like, and yeah, who? then who survives that, right? It's that resiliency. And so they're just two totally different models. I have a crazy idea that just came to my mind. Um, what if we were to get people together to raise a bunch of money to fund a union that would pay for these workers to strike? So there are unions, like I put the name up above, um, United Farm Workers is the big one. Um, and then regionally, there are smaller unions that are getting started, and I'm sure that they would love support, but there are pockets almost everywhere. The one that's here in Washington, it's the biggest one, is um, Familia Sunidas por la Justicia, United Families for Justice. Um, and so, yeah, they, I mean, they love donations and that kind of stuff. But Yeah, um, what if we could just raise a whole lot of money for them to have a whole lot more power? I know, actually, I came in, I had to leave for a while. So I came okay. in at the end of your discussion. So, but what you were just talking just made me think like, really, this, you really could empower them. Actually, money can actually do something here, possibly. You know, just an idea. Where's the source yeah, of money going to come from, really? I mean, it has to, yeah, that's, that's to fund them. I mean, it has to be a large amount. Yeah. Well, what if there's a large amount of people? Um, I, you know, it goes back to me believing lots of people. And whether it's be a good idea or not, but it's just an idea. I was just thinking how other people have fought for their rights and other people supporting them and giving them an opportunity um, to do that. And what if we were to maybe do an, a buying strike on certain things, which obviously we're doing in some ways, but. I, I would put forth the thought that if we were able to raise such a sum, why don't we just buy land and allow them to work it and sell it at a profit? You're so true. That's so true. It just, it was a build, random thought. Build the world you want to see. Don't try and tear down the old one. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, well, I, honestly, I think that both are, I mean, it's difficult to like deconstruct the house using the tool. What is the whole like, you know, taking apart the house using the master's tools kind of thing while still living there. Um, you know, that's a tricky thing. So I actually think that it's great on both fronts. My kind of word of, um, not caution, but just of direction to really um, let folks who were in that world and living that life take the lead and to figure out how to support. And so like contacting them directly, like, you know, um, if you scroll up, the there's the name of our local um, union, you know, you're welcome to like contact them or United Farm Workers just in general and be like, hey, do you want me to set up a Kickstarter for you? Or, you know, like, how can I be helpful? Because they've got volunteer needs and they've got donation needs. And um, so it's a really great way that we can kind of offer support without trying to take over the movement. Um, but then, yeah, I think you're right. Like the Familia Sunita, not the Familia Sunita, the, the Cooperativa that I mentioned. Um, I don't know if David, um, if you were there for that, David Algren. Um, no, what we were talking about. So there were former farm workers who did, they kind of saved and got grants and um, purchased land and they have now expanded. They just bought 65 acres in the past year. Um, so they've really got quite an operation now and they're, you know, organic berry growers and super delighted and their families are happy. And so I, I think that that is definitely a, a better model. There's a lot in there about food sovereignty and yeah, it's, it's a really beautiful thing. Well, and I also think on the permaculture world, I actually think that this, we need to, we need to be paying a living wage ourselves. I've seen perma, quote unquote permaculture farms that aren't paying people what they're worth. And, and really, I would say they claim to be a permaculture farm, but they, they do backbreaking work and they really are degenerative. And I would, I would speak out right now and say that the wolfing movement, I've known lots of wolfers who came through my research farm who had stories that, I, that are hideous. We need to stop that. We need to treat everyone with sovereignty. And that, you know, just because you're a woofer does not mean you don't need to be, have a positive energy exchange. So um, I think we need to be cautious of that. <laughs> Where are you working? It's key. Just cut in and out. Um, yeah, Mike, can you say that again? Just well, really. it, uh, what's, uh, it strikes me as you say that uh, we also have a program that's uh, in addition to woofers, there's uh, what we've taken advantage of at Sahali is, um, is a program that's called uh, Work Away. And the people that have come to work on our place, you know, they work a couple hours a day 
uh, usually no more than 20 hours a week, but we know for a fact that there are farms where they are expected to work a full day and they don't get paid any wages. And that they're part of the, uh, uh, the work away program. So you have to be aware of where you're going, the kind of reputation that the place has. Mm. And that's really sad by the movement. And, I, and I, I'd work hard to try to just speak out against that and to, to say that we really should be doing better and if we are doing better, it'll actually attract some amazing work, you know? What if we were to, to be able to expand because we had people willing to work hard um, and work well um, and be paid what they're worth, you know, and, and be valued as an energy exchange. And that's when we can start multiplying permaculture out is when we can actually be doing this on a large scale. And of course, two justice issues. Um, one is that I hope folks have either seen or will go see the documentary 13th, which is about the 13th Amendment and the kind of modern version of the slave trade, which is using prison labor for pennies uh, on the hour. <laughs> and it's shocking the number of things that they do, everything from firefighting to building Boeing airplanes to working for Victoria's Secret. But it's really um, an eye-opening documentary that's very well done. Um, and the other is that anytime we talk about expanding permaculture, which I hope we see more and more of that, is the question of land access, um, not just for migrant farm labor, but, you know, kind of for all of our young people who want to start doing this and want to restore land and want to be regenerative. Um, but land access is a, is a huge barrier for a lot of people. Mm. Here's an interesting question from Christy. How much land do we need to sustain a family of four? Of course, the permaculture answer is it depends. Um, on how much, but yeah, I'm glad to see that people are sharing some of their experiences in the chat. How do you work around zoning laws about housing? I can see that providing housing can be a trade-off to incentivize workers, but I see zoning laws being an obstacle. So if it's agricultural land and they're cleared, like it's an agribusiness, and they're cleared for guest workers in the H-2A program, then they're approved to have that kind of housing. They're, it's like dormitory style housing. So it's a specific thing for that farming. They don't it's, they don't even have to sneak. I would add, you can also build housing that's under 10 by 10 and every county has its own kind of codes to that, but you can, some are 10 by 12 or 10 by 15 and you just do little small platforms and little spaces. Um, could be cute, cob, whatever. Um, and they can have attached porches, so. Those, yeah, oh, those yeah. are not always legal. No, um, you have to check your local legal, codes. They're not legal for habitation. Those are sheds. Um, yeah. Not, uh, most of the places, you know, just like That's trying crazy. to live in an RV, it's like, uh-uh. That, all that needs to be changed. Marcy, are you mm -hmm. talking about um, like a large agribusiness industrial farms? Or are you talking about like small scale permaculture farms and the kind of the woofing or work away sort of thing? When you were talking about like um, a small place can, you know, have workers and maybe it wouldn't be backbreaking work for um, agricultural workers. So that model would be difficult <clears throat> to provide housing if you're not zoned for that, because otherwise the only other model is if you had a big agricultural land that was zoned agriculture with a lot of acres, then yeah, they would have those little, those little shacks that, um, that were like substandard. So yeah, if it, the zoning laws seem to be an obstacle to me. Well, how like, Brian, I know that you are a good example here because you live in community more or less. Yeah. Well, I, I would say a couple of things. One, most of the stuff we wanna do to make the world a better place comes up against some kind of policy. And at some point you just have to be bold. Um, you know, and so look, and, and a lot of the times when it comes to housing and stuff like that, it really depends on how secluded you are, how friendly your neighbors are, all these kind of things as to, as to what you can do and what you, what you can get away with and what you can't, you know. Um, so it's a really big topic. Um, I've come across it with doing earthworks and ponds. I've come across it with housing. I've come across it with um, run, you know, running essentially easements and stuff through places. 
Um, you know, you, with buffers on wetlands, I mean, all these kind of things, I, they have ludicrous kind of ideals. And so, yeah, you should be able to, to file for a variance and get mixed zoning where it's an intent, a clustered structures, intentional community ag, you know, uh, a lot of these big ag properties, they're whatever, a small one's 50 acres to 100 acres, you know, and larger. And um, one dwelling and a, a caretaker dwelling, that's not reasonable. So these, you know, and we need bold people to actually challenge it in the, in the, within the system. And then we also need bold people that just do it and see how far things can go. Um, you know, I'm not advocating to do anything that's going to endanger anybody or, or, you know, put anything at jeopardy, but you have to find that space for yourself and to know that a lot of these policies have been written and established um, by people that don't live on the land. They don't see things seasonally. They don't see how the changing tide, they were maybe written 50 years ago or something, you know? Um, so you have, I don't know. That's my take on it anyway. <laughs> uh, can I share something real quick about Clallam County? Um, here there's a, uh, if you, even a small farm, like three acres or one acre, if it's designated as a farm, there can be farm worker dwellings that are anything mobile or temporary, like a, like a motor home or a yurt, and those are approved by our county. Even though there is a lot of restriction on ADUs, there's a lot of grace for farm worker housing. And there's even a protocol in the um, city planning paper, though we're really harsh on gray water systems, we allow pit toilets and incinerator toilets. And there's a lot of kind of alternative waste systems that are allowed by the county. Um, so that's all, that's helpful. And I think I it oh, oh, yep, go ahead. Well, uh, I'm a, I've been a realtor for 30 years and 40% of all my property sales have been rural properties, country land. And uh, so what I was going to say is that, you know, in Oregon now, uh, they're trying to loosen up the laws, as you may have heard. So they don't really want to have any single family houses um, on lots anymore. They, they, I mean, you can have them, but now they want to have like a secondary unit or a duplex. And so that is lightened up. And even in the country, and we have some of the strictest land law, land use laws in the country because of the land use um, laws that were passed, I think, in the mid um, 60s or 70s, I can't miss about 40 years, 50 years ago. And so, but what, what they do allow, they do allow an exclusive farm zone, you can have what's called a caretaker dwelling. And that does not have to be owned by a relative. And that can be a manufactured home or a stick built house. And then if you want to put up an 850 square foot secondary unit, uh, they don't want to see a 220 plug in it. And it's not supposed to be rented out. So it would be mainly for people who are relatives again, or people who are friends working in the farm or buying into the farm. So uh, Oregon is very difficult to have people live out in the land. And, and I, I've been a member of Thousand Friends of Oregon on and off for decades, but I don't support the idea that, you know, we, we can't have these permaculture homesteads because of the, the strict land use laws. However, at the same time, I would say that Ken Kern, who was the author of the owner build home, the owner build homestead, the owner builder in the code, and a fourth uh, book. He actually um, was leading the movement for the alternative housing in Northern California. I think it was called United Stand about 50 years ago. And he actually died from the roof of an experimental house falling on his head. So like I'm totally in, in favor of the hemp creek idea. And you know, they built 150,000 commercial hemp a uh, building in Europe out of hemp straw bales. Instead of using straw, they used hemp bales, which are easier to tamp, I understand. And then you can put the um, hemp treat in the, in the front and the back, in, inside and the outside for, for uh, fireproofing and waterproofing. The problem is our codes in this country are so strict. And so we, we really need to look into the hemp tree because we're throwing away tons of um, the herds of hemp or the leftover stock of the inside of the plant. And I please, uh, everybody, please get, try to get somebody you know to take the online class on industrial hemp. 
It's the only one in the world offered with this level of uh, 25 world-class educators through Oregon State University Corvallis College of Forestry. He's been teaching it for about five years. If you're an Oregonian, age 65 or over, you get it free. Otherwise, it's about 800 bucks. But that'll give you kind of the latest clues on what's going on with the industrial hemp movement worldwide. And also hempbuilding.com, the international conference that just took place last week, the ninth symposium. Uh, that's headquarters out of Ireland. They're, they're doing it all over the world. It's just really hard to get anything done in this country. Well, thank you for those uh, recommendations for the hemp. I think we'll have a hemp presentation uh, tomorrow morning, and I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about with uh, Jacques, so that will be great to go into more hemp policy because it's definitely fascinating. Um, Terry, I just, while I have you here, I had one question. Uh, how were those fruit trees uh, that I, I think I planted towards the end on the hillside across from the bees? Um, are they any of them established or taking root? So the ones kind of going towards the south field extension? Yeah. Um, which, by the way, it took us a year, but we finally have a beautiful deer fence that works on the south field extension. Wow. Um, that was key, I know, because we were losing everything to deer. Uh, so yeah, it was a, a huge project. That's all done. So David, we call it Sad Tree Hill um, because it's a little sad. So they don't get a whole lot of sun, but in part because those huge plum trees, there's a line of Italian plums that shade mm -hmm. uh, that whole hill. And they're pretty diseased. They were never really pruned well. Um, and so it has witches, they all have witches broom. So we did a oh, hard, no. hard pruning. And some of them were like, we may kill this tree. And we were like, I'm okay with that. Like it, it, <laughs> it had kind of run its course. And then they all bounced back and are doing fine. Some of them are still diseased, but there's a lot more airflow. Like we actually can move. We got rid of all of the kind of trashy wire stuff that was under there. So it's all navigable oh. and things like that. The Asian pear trees, they actually have a couple fruit on them. They just look really young. So we're hoping that they'll actually start to grow in a more normal fashion. Yeah, I think I was talking a different uh, place because there was no oh. wire fencing. Um, but I think uh, we have a presentation scheduled um, for, I think, 6.15. So I think we're going to start listening okay. to about draft horses. But I just want to say that was a wonderful presentation. And I think Thanks for joining I can me, speak everybody. on behalf of everyone. It was a pleasure to attend. You did a great job. I can tell you are an online teacher right now. <laughs> I'm actually in person, which is its own very tricky thing right now. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, David, um, would you, I don't know, I, we have me and uh, Cassie scheduled 